So we have two different type of processes described by the same VT. The one is emission described by the V. And therefore, if we write now the transition rate, by skipping all the intermediate steps, 2 pi or h bar bni squared. Now let me see whether I have to write it to single to group or single to single transition. Let me check the notes. Although it doesn't matter. Yes. <coughs> single to single to group. I I think it's I have to write it a bit bigger. Row E N E N is E I minus H bar omega. As you can see, we have already discussed that. And what is the picture of this? The picture is here, EI and EN. It comes down and this energy is emitted away. And there is the ab absorption, absorption, which is described by the well, the signs are important. That's why I'm really emphasizing the difference. Wi again to group is 2 pi over h bar vni dagger squared. Let's not forget about the averaging over the final states because it's a single to group transition. And so single to group transition, rho en, en is ei plus h bar omega. And the, if I plot the scheme for this, v take the energy and move up absorb the external energy, move up to an excited level. So the first upper picture is the emission, the lower picture is the absorption processes. You see how uh, uh, simple these things are in principle once we understood the simplest problem of time dependence, that is constant potential really has provided us a lot of input for this rather complicated looking harmonic perturbation type of problems. I think that is just uh, the, the right point to turn our attention to physical problems. Well, these are, remember, although, the, yes. This emission, uh, emission uh, term, uh, the transition in yes. I know. But uh, I couldn't see the difference here. Well, here, it, for this particular discussion, it doesn't matter. Now, if we read the book, I don't want to get into those details because it is the formalism which I am describing. Let's see what he says. Uh, he doesn't, he says stimulated emission. So what is the, the stimulator? The emission is the stimulated emission. So the spontaneous emission is obviously a different matter in here. So let's uh, follow Kamil's suggestion and let's put the stimulated. Obviously there is a need for the, the it is to be perturbed, right? Stimulated to make the emission obviously. Can we the term of transition rate of spontaneous emission? From the perturbation theory to the perturbation theory. I just No, no. Uh, I don't want to get into, as I said, the, the, the technical details are beyond the, the discussion at this point. What we are just 
saying is that take these harmonic perturbations as a sort of uh, generic type of terms and let's see what kind of expressions perturbation theory gives for that. What is the actual mechanism of stimulation? It's not described in here. But he says that this is relevant for the stimulated emission because it cannot go on and emit something on its own, obviously. There must be some kind of stimulation around. Yeah, anyway. This harmonic perturbation uh, potential is generated by the incoming uh, photons, electric field. Right? That's true. But I'm just moving into that subject. Then we can turn our attention to actual details of that uh, when, when I finish the discussion. Okay, the next subject is uh, really applications to the interactions with the classical radiation. So we, the next subject is atoms in classical radiation fields. Atoms in classical radiation field. Well, this is to be explicitly stated that it's classical because we, are, we, are, we have a quantum mechanical object, which is the atomic electron. And in principle, if you want to discuss everything in fully quantum mechanically, you have to treat the radiation quantum wise. I don't want to call it quantum mechanically because you need quantum field theory to discuss that in quantum sense. And that takes us beyond the scope of this uh, class. So we are going to treat the radiation external radi radiation as classical and the atomic electron is atomic electron, quantum mechanical. So this is an important subject in its own right because there are plenty of things that we have to discuss at this level and it's going to take us to the gauge problem. So let me start discussing it. What we have is again it is in the context of the time dependent potentials we have a term which we denote H0 and a term which we denote as Vt. H0 is, for instance, the Coulomb. Let's take it as an example, as the Coulomb Hamiltonian. So this is not only relevant for hydrogen, but all hydrogen-like atoms is described by that, right? Say P squared over 2m plus minus if you want ZE squared divided by R, hydrogen-like atoms will be described by that. Well, what you have is an atom described by such a Hamiltonian, and then you send light on it. Light is an electromagnetic wave, right? It therefore, it's going to have time dependence. And so it's going to lead to terms of that sort. I say it's going to lead to terms of that sort. How do we construct that Vt? As I said, the problem is, here is the atom, here is the, the electronic cloud, and there is light coming in. We are going to, uh, finally, it's going to be moved to dipole, dipole approximation business, but for the ultimate purpose, but let's go straightforwardly now. How do we construct the problem and reduce it to that form? So we start from this H0, and we have an external electromagnetic radiation field described by A and phi potentials. Eventually we'll use the four vector notation A mu for this. This is specifying your external radiation. So what is the uh, rule of subjecting this atom to this radiation field? We use the minimal substitution principle, right? Which is A 
emu goes to well let me not move into that yet not to frighten you let me do it rather simply at this level because when i move into the relativistic quantum mechanics we'll go into full detail what we do is go from here now to This A is the external radiation. Notice that it's already a bound system. There's a Coulomb force of the nucleus binding the electron together. But you now when we put this system in an external radiation field, obviously this momentum is to be replaced by that to take care of the, the effect of the external radiation field. Well, this was already there for the Coulomb binding force plus we can have an additional piece, right? Which is E phi. Phi is this phi. Both, the, all these four potentials describe the radiation field. Therefore, this is the modified version of the H0. We started with the H0, we move to this one. Eventually, I will manipulate on this Hamiltonian and reduce it to that form. It's going to be an H0, the original H0, plus some terms. But here, uh, there is the subtlety of the gauge invariance, and we have to discuss this a little bit, because we have to fix the gauge because of the gauge invariance problem. Gauge invariance is one of the most fundamental principles of the physics. It has always been so. Nowadays, recently, it is uh, the sort of the, at the heart of all kind of physics. What do I mean by this? Well, in, <coughs> in classical physics, well, there are the E and B fields, right, electric and magnetic fields. Once you specify those fields, then you can use, say, anybody's, uh, anybody's uh, version of classical equation. Well, I say anybody's. There's a Newton's version, Hamilton version, hamilton Jacobi version, Poisson's version, Lagrange version, right? All these are classical mechanics, they are all equivalent to each other, but let's take the, let's take the Newton's version because it's so simple. It is, uh, so if it is a charge Q is inserted there, one over C, B cross B, so that gives you the Lorentz force. E and B are given, that gives you the force, and once the right-hand side is given, Using the Newton's law, you can determine the trajectories and the, how the system moves, etc. So E and B play the important role. However, not only in quantum mechanics, in the Hamilton or Poisson's version of classical, or Lagrange version of classical physics, there are Still, let me focus on quantum because this makes more sense in quantum physics. In qu as I said, I'm being a bit careful. Uh, my main purpose is not to discuss the differences between different versions of classical physics. So let's move from classical to quantum. We know that in the quantum physics, <coughs> the basic entity is the Hamiltonian because that is what enters into the equation of motion, Schrodinger's equation of motion. And the Hamiltonian, <coughs> if you start from the free particle, the Hamiltonian for the interaction of this system of this particle, this charged particle in an external radiation field is given as such. You see, there it was E and B entering into the equations of motion. It's here A and phi is entering into the equation of motion because H gives you the Schrodinger equation. <clears throat> and what are the relationship between the, so it is the E and B there, it is the A and phi here. 
there are some mismatches. First of all, there are three E components, three B components. Altogether, there are six fields. And here, there are four potentials. And at first, you may say even the numbers do not match. There are six entities there and four entities in here. And we know how to relate these two sets of entities to each other. What are the expressions? Let's relate them. E can be obtained from the potentials through this manner, minus the gradient of the scalar potential, minus 1 over C dA dt. That is, both A and phi enters into the construction of the electric field. If it is static, no time dependence, of course, you are familiar from your freshman physics, that is minus the gradient of the phi. But when everything is dynamics, <coughs> Dynamical, then of course, A also enters into the construction of the electric field, and the B is the curl of the A. So at least you know how to relate these two sets. Well, if it was so, and if there was no ambiguity, then life could have been quite easy, but here comes some beautiful surprises, some redundancies. And usually these redundancies lead to something profound and it's going to lead to something profound as well. If you're not used to these kind of arguments, you may say it is annoying because what we claim is that these A and phi are not unique. So the claim. A and phi are not unique. <clears throat> there are infinitely many A5 families which all lead to the same EB. <clears throat> Let me illustrate this. For example, if A goes to A prime, which is A minus the gradient of an arbitrary function of space and time and phi goes to phi prime which is phi plus 1 over c df the same f dt obviously this a prime and phi prime there are infinitely many of them because f is an arbitrary function Let's demonstrate that these uh, prime fields, potentials, all give the same EB, which you would expect, expect from here. Well, there is an EB set you get from these A phi through those definitions. And you will get, say, E prime, B prime. Normally, that's what you expect, right? A different set of E, e and B. Let's show that these EB, E prime, B prime are the same as EB, so therefore, Potentials are not unique. But the demonstration is not that difficult. Let's do it rather fast. So what is the E prime? Normally E prime is minus del phi prime minus 1 over C dA prime dt. Let's substitute the primed quantities in terms of the unprimed ones. So it is minus the phi plus 1 over C df dt minus 1 over c d by dt a minus del f. So what do I have? I have, first of all, minus the gradient of phi appeared. And from here, minus 1 over c da dt appeared. What are the additional terms? Notice the additional term minus the gradient df dt, the b minus here, plus the, the d by dt, the gradient of f. Well, let me write it. Although it may sound stupid for some of you, please excuse me for writing such a trivial thing. So I will write it as d df dt coming from the first term. There is a minus sign. Here it is minus and minus is plus, 
So I have to compensate that because there's an overall minus sign in here. D by dt, del f. You may, oh, well, you say that doesn't cancel, does it? It does, right? Why? Because the one is the space derivative, the other is the time derivative. And those derivatives commute among themselves, therefore they cancel. So you get indeed E. Uh -huh. So it didn't lead to something new. It gave the same E as before. And we can repeat the same argument for the B. If you substitute here, B prime is del cross A prime. If you write the A prime as A minus the gradient, del cross the gradient is zero, right? Curl of the gradient. Therefore, it's automatic. It's more easy for easier for to see that b prime is the same as b. That's nice, or not nice, perhaps. Well, in a sense, it is nice that they all lead to the same e b because if there were other b's, e's and b's, and then uh, uh, then uh, you would say uh, what? Well, but you you wouldn't be surprised because you are cooking up these transformations yourself anyway. So it is a circular argument. What we discovered is that the, under these transformations, E and B are invariant, same. So classical physics require the knowledge of E and B, the measurement of E and B, because that's what you measure in the laboratory. So if you have the same E and B, so what's the meaning of these transformations? What is the meaning of this non-uniqueness? Is it something bad? Well, in principle, you may say it's bad, because if A and phi are the ones which is entering into the Hamiltonian, if he can use infinitely many different A and phi, not to affect what's going on in the laboratory, the same physics you are getting, so this may not be a meaningful theory in the first place. The gauge theory of Hamiltonian the Schrodinger theory may not be a meaningful theory. You give me one set of A and phi, I give you another set, they all give the same physics. So which one of, which one of these A and phi are the correct A and phi? Well, so that's so-called gauge freedom. This redundancy, non-uniqueness, is something beautiful, not undesirable or annoying. It is called the gauge freedom. And there's a reason of this gauge freedom, actually. Now, let's, I cannot move that much into the quantum theory of the uh, light, that's the photon theory of light, but let me try to explain a little bit why there is such a freedom, non-uniqueness. It is something required. Again, let's go through the A and phi. Well, this is what you need, to, at least in the quantum mechanics. Do you need to know these to describe quantum theory? Well, there are four mathematical degrees of freedom. Right? Because A and phi, 3 A and 1 phi is 4. Well, actually, light or its quantum version, the particles, are strange entities. Light is a plane wave, and there are E and B oscillating alternatively on that plane wave. It moves perpendicular to that front. Well, you know from optics, at least, as I said, this is a bit more advanced than the level of this class. There are two polarizations for the light, two polarizations. Well, being on the plane front, it's sort of more or less suggestive that there are two polarizations, orthogonal or circular. So two physical degrees of freedom. Two polarization means physical degrees of freedom. So there are four mathematical degrees of freedom in the formulation. In physics, there are two physical degrees of freedom. Physical degrees of freedom. So in a consistent theory, if you describe 
the physics of light together with the other quantum mechanical issues, you, you need to describe them in terms of the correct degrees of freedom. You need two degrees of freedom, as there are two physical degrees of freedom. For mathematical freedom, freedom contains overcounting, right? Two degrees of freedom are to be eliminated. So need to cut down, need to cut down the number of degrees of freedom freedom from 4 to 2 that's actually why this redundancy this non-uniqueness is good you can use this non-uniqueness to reduce the number of degrees of freedom from 4 down to 2. How do we do that? As I said, it's again a bit beyond the level of this class. It takes us to the quantum field theory in a sense, but let me describe briefly and intuitively a little bit. There are several gauge fixing procedures. It's called the gauge fixing. That is this cutting down from four down to two. One very popular one, there are several ways. But the, the, the most, one of the most popular ones, although it's problematic in its own right, most popular ones is <coughs> Coulomb gauge fixing. Okay, so it's what we are going to use in this class without getting into the actual justification why we do such things. It is the following. You say, choose a such that it satisfies divergence of A is equal to zero. Here is one mathematical equation. You had started with the four, three A and one phi, and one mathematical equation, obviously one constraint which helps you to eliminate one mathematical degree of freedom down. But obviously that's not sufficient, right? The second, it's usually, it's not specifically spelled out that openly, choose phi is equal to zero together with. So it gives you two mathematical conditions. Or in using the technical terminology, two constraints. which are obviously four mathematical degrees of freedom plus two conditions. Obviously, you can use those two conditions to eliminate from four to two so that your physics laws, your equations contain the correct degrees of freedom. That's required for the consistency. And in, the, in terms of uh, the basic terminology, that's essentially it. When we say gauge fixing, that's what we are, what we, we are doing. So let's proceed then. Let's go back to that uh, example that I have started. What did we have? We had, we started with the H0, which was the Coulomb one. And I moved to an H. I have sent some light on this system. And to take into account the effect of that light, I have written the new Hamiltonian now as such, well, there is the Coulomb potential, let me write it as V Coulomb, R, plus the new E phi. So this term and that term are the new terms which are brought in by this A phi. Now I will choose the gauge, Coulomb gauge. 
So if I choose now the Coulomb gauge, then that term is automatically killed because I choose the external phi to be zero. I choose it. That's my choice. And so let's see what we get. H is 1 over P squared over 2M plus the Coulomb potential. Let's keep it as a group to give you back the H0. And there are several additional terms which I need to write. E over 2MC A dot P plus P dot A, the cross terms which I get from here, and plus E squared over 2M C squared A squared. There's an additional term. So there are two additional terms, actually. So let's further manipulate. And let me take into account the remaining Coulomb gauge. Part of the Coulomb gauge choice was phi equals 0. I already used it. I haven't used this divergencelessness condition. So let's use that as well. How do I use that? I will use it in the cross term. as follows. Cross term is a dot p, p dot a. Let me focus on the p dot a term. p dot a term. And there is this, in the Schrodinger equation, there is this psi on it, right? As there is psi on it, well, it acts on here and it acts on there. p is an operator which acts everything to the right of it. So, if it acts on the first one, what does it give? Minus i h bar, the divergence of a finished, it's, it's acted on the first one, plus a dotted into p psi. So that's how it decomposes, it's an operator. So this term becomes exactly like this first term in the cross term, therefore the h becomes h becomes h0, the original h0 that we have started with, minus e over mc a dot p, y I say so, e over 2mc a dot p, there, there's another a dot p coming from here making it 2 times a dot p which cancels the 2. And what is remaining now, the remaining terms are the following e squared over 2mc squared minus i over h bar, no i h bar, sorry, times e divided by 2mc these, these are the additional pieces that I have. Well obviously this I will denote together with the sign as the vt H0 plus Vt is constructed as promised to describe the time-dependent effect of the external radiation on the atomic system. And there are these two terms. Well, now I use the, the second Coulomb gauge condition. Phi equals 0 I already used and divergence of A is equal to 0 now I'm using. And this one is there depending on the strength of the external radiation. If it is a strong radiation, you retain it and you know it, its effects are quite well known and it can be worked out in certain Landau level problem, for instance. If it is a weak radiation, you can drop it, write it down. If can be dropped for very weak radiations. Why? Because let's, there is 1 over c squared, which is a quite a large number. A, if it is weak, a squared is already weak. And if it is ordinary visible light shining on the atom, you can estimate the strength of this term. Please do it on your own. Some of you, perhaps experimentalists, come in. Imagine, estimate the strength of this term as compared to the first. What is the strength of the first? 10 electron volts, right, typically in the, in the basis. And if, if what is the typical uh, a field that you are using in your lasers, or whatever, just take those. Yes, yes. 
So you can estimate it. What, what is the percentage of this? Beautiful, okay. So that's uh, already... Uh, the effect of magnetic field terms while we are calculating the... Very good. Very good. Well, or, or else you can think of the following. Take a homogeneous B, homogeneous and constant in the Z direction, and eliminate A in terms of the B, one half of BR, so it's even to support your argument, it becomes E squared, B squared, M squared, C squared, and then R squared if it is atomic size scale. This is less than one part in 100,000 as compared to the 10 electron voltage Coulomb potential energy. So you can estimate this is real physics, not mathematics. There is no way that I drop it off the hand. Depending on the laboratory conditions, this can be dropped, but that's the Coulomb gauge again. That is the Coulomb gauge. Remember, never forget this. Two conditions, phi equals zero, divergence of A is equal to zero. You usually look at the books, they usually say divergence of A equal to zero, basta. No, it's not the case. These two conditions together form the Coulomb gauge condition. So we are in game now. Here we have H is equal to H zero plus VT, and VT is minus E over E over MC A dot P. Nice. This is the A form, not the uh, dip dipole approximation form, which is E dot D, which I am going to demonstrate later. But here, this is the standard one, which follows from the simple gauge theory. Okay, so. Let's focus on the external radiation and let to start with, let's consider the monochromatic plane wave. Satisfying the Coulomb gauge condition, that's important. Huh? So I now introduce the external radiation field in the form as external. I will describe this and we'll stop for today. Radiation field. I choose the Coulomb gauge condition. The first condition is already there. There is no phi component. <coughs> and I choose a monochromatic plane wave. Plane wave to guarantee the Coulomb gauge condition, the second one, which I write as 2A0, the amplitude, times the polarization on the, f you, it's a plane fronted wave propagate perpendicular to the plane, epsilon is the unit vector describing the polarization. The monochromaticity is this, omega over C, n dot x minus omega t. This unit vector is the propagation. This unit vector is the polarization. And they are orthogonal to each other. That's an important thing. That's optics. They are units and they are orthogonal to each other. And the, the picture is like this. Epsilon describes the polarization and is the unit vector. I have to write it in proper. That's how it moves. Let me check the Coulomb gauge condition and we'll stop at this point. That is, a, we, ch we have chosen phi equals zero, and how about the divergence of this? Is it really, is this choice guaranteed the, the Coulomb gauge fixing condition? If I take the divergence of this, it comes here and picks n, right? n dot e epsilon. There is sign and everything and minus omega over c, etc. That's not important. When you take the divergence, uh, the divergence of this, it picks the n out, puts it into the dot product of this. It's epsilon dot. It's proportional to, let me write it as follows. It's important. Numbers times epsilon dot n and other functions. 
The detail is not important. You pick this. So divergence of A is zero. Indeed, this configuration, this way of formulating the monochromatic plane wave is consistent with the Coulomb gauge condition. Therefore, this is indeed the correct form to use. If A doesn't satisfy the Coulomb gauge condition, I cannot use this as my potential additional time dependent potential. So once we constructed this, we can stop at this point. It's a good point to stop. We'll continue with this important problem next week and we'll finish the entire thing. <laughs>